The Southern African Development Community SADC meeting of Ministers of Employment, Labour and Social Partners was officially opened on the 7th of March 2019 in Venduk by Honourable Eric King and Tina, Minister of Labour, Industrial Relations and Employment Creation. Nimtina serves as the chairperson of SADC Committee of Ministers, Employment, Labour and Social Partners. During the opening ceremony, the speakers made their remarks by highlighting the importance of the meeting before the main speech by Honourable Nimtina, the Minister of Labour, Industrial Relations and Creation. We are meeting at a difficult time where our economics are not performing as hoped, where government revenues are constrained and unemployment, especially among the youth and the women, is very high. This is not a time to despair, but to seek new and more effective ways to meet the current and the future challenges. Honorable Ministers, at the beginning, I congratulated those who have already concluded their election successfully. It is clear that this is an election year in the Sadaka region. Therefore, I also with South Africa, Malawi, Mozambique, Botswana, and Namibia, good luck in conducting their election peacefully and successfully too. I now hereby officially open this meeting of SADC Ministers for Labor and Social Partners. I thank you. The aim of the meeting was to seek consensus on how to achieve coherent, harmonized actions in promoting streamlined pro-employment policy across ministries such as labor, finance, trade, and planning. These actions were aimed to increase productivity and decent jobs for all, especially for the youth and women. The panel, which comprised of executive directors, director general, principal secretaries and trade union leaders, deliberated on various issues such as strengthening joint sector programs for pro-employment, social economic policies and budgeting, as well as the global compact for safe, orderly and regular migration in thousand Africa. We are saying that we think we believe we need a, a, an overhaul of the current education and, and training curriculum in the SADC region that is going to respond to the, the new technology. And of course, we're in the fourth industrial revolution. We have started with the first, second, and third currently where we are. The fourth industrial revolution is not a new thing, but it is a reality. And, and we want to agree as workers in the region that there can be no point where workers can be replaced by robots. Because the impact of it, if we're not going to deal with lifelong learning is, and the just transition, is the reality that uh, robots cannot consume what they will be producing. As much as they can be e efficient in, in, in running production, in increasing profitability, but they would not consume the products that they are producing. And therefore, to grow the economy, to grow the region, you need to have workers. So workers must be at the center of the growth in our countries and in our region. Well, uh, the Sajak region of uh, Africa <coughs> is well endowed with uh, natural resources. I don't even have to mention them, gold, diamonds, uh, copper, and everything else. The seas around our continent are full of other resources. All of these resources are required by the global community. What we should be doing as a region now, as Africa in fact, is to start looking at what it is that we can do to stop the flow of our resources to what is known as the developed world, to stop being uh, the exporters of uh, raw materials and importers uh, of finished goods. There's no reason why we should not be able to extract these uh, resources 
uh, add value to them, beneficiate, and sell them to those who need it, who need them. So if you are able, therefore, to harness our resources, we should be able to empower the youth and workers of our people by ensuring that education, for instance, is free from grade R up to the highest level so that uh, at all times we have the resources, I mean the skills that are required by the fourth industrial revolution. It's clear that the issue of youth is a major challenge for us. The questions are showing it. We have a representative from the young people. The question that comes to mind, uh, and re it really paints a picture that private sector continues to be about profit and is not concerned about human-centered approaches. That, that, is, that is what is clear. It has been said 40% of the population of SADC is, lives in poverty. But this is further fact. Of the people that are employed, because they are not earning a living wage, they too are living in poverty because they zula to survive, even if they are being paid at the end of the month. Uh, people that are working are living in shacks still. Would one then call that working? Um, let, me, let me park that bus for, for now. Um, what we have recognized in terms of the recommendations that have been given in um, is number one, the aspect of universal labor guarantee. Um, it is to ensure that if ministers and if governments have the political will to set minimum wage, then they might as well have the political will to set a minimum living wage. Um, that's the first one that we want to address and agree with the ILO on. The other aspect is what has been addressed by um, Madam Double President um, with regards to a curriculum. One of the recommendations that the SADC young leaders from across the countries of the member states, one of the recommendations that they had given at the SADC Youth Forum is saying there must be a curriculum that speaks to the now in public schools across the SADC states. If it happens in Namibia and Namibia has entrepreneurship as a subject in school, then it must be so in the rest of the Salic states because if we are going to be serious about the future of work, we need to then address that aspect now. And that then ties into the aspect of lifelong learning. If we don't teach our people, having spoken with them, having asked the question of what is it that is needed within this environment that you work in, we will forever be putting policies in place that are far-fetched. Meaning, once the policy is passed and the policy gets out into the public, the public and the workers will still be wondering, how does that speak to me now? And so that aspect of having to ask the question to those that are affected is very important. And, and lastly, the aspect of informal sector, and I think private sector has addressed that, that matter as well. Um, in one of our conferences in Namibia on informal sector and making it formal, the question popped up, and the question was, who says the informal sector wants to become formal. Who, who says that? Has, have they been asked that they want to become formal? Or is it, a, is, is it a matter of wanting informal sector to become formal, to get into the monopoly of what the private sector wants? I guess the point was transitioning uh, from, from uh, informal to formal. Um, and, and I... I, and I you know, I, I had my, uh, the young person there uh, raising the point sharply that uh, who, who said the informal set, sector wants to be formal. I think, I, I don't want to ask him a question, but I just want to make a point on this, that um, there comes a time when, when you run an informal business, you have to, I think when you start a business, your objective is not to be a small business uh, person forever. So you want to grow. And part of growing is to transition from being a small uh, entity to a much more bigger entity so that you're able to create opportunity, open opportunities for others uh, so that young people can get um, employed. So I got the sense that uh, he viewed it more, the issue of transitioning, he viewed it more as an imposition rather than um, a logical progression um, from being a small entity into a bigger entity. I think we need more of our informal uh, entities to 
migrate or to transition from informal to, to formal. Thank you, Chair. Um, I agree with what the Deputy Minister ha has said in terms of the transition aspect in informal to formal. Yes, that is what must happen. But the two billion people, as was alluded to by the Mr. Biggin um, delegate, the aspect will not happen overnight. And therefore, they cannot be held hostage by not receiving social protection now. And that is why the recommendation on strengthening social protection as young people we support, there must be avenues that the two billion in the informal sector must receive social protection now. That's the first one. Um, of the recommendations of this, um, of the Sadak Youth Forum, look, entrepreneurship is an aspect that young people have been running with. And young people are able to create their own employment. All that they need is a space to do that. Um, CH and Dealer, South Africa, not in my name, is the foundation that he runs successfully in what he does. Um, Robert Katende from Uganda has a chess federation known as the Robert Katende Initiative, um, effective in what he does. About 200 young people across the continent that has been doing that effectively. All they need and must be having is the space to do that. And so we call on governments, especially SADC states, to ensure that their entrepreneurship hubs, whether it's in every state in your country or whether it is in rural areas, there must be entrepreneurship hubs to ensure that the skills transfer happens. Secondly, private sector must take into account that there's programming where skills transfer is done between private sector and through uh, youth councils. And lastly, nothing can happen without finance. And so we make a call upon government to, as they talk, to walk the walk and put budget allocations for young people to effectively address their own problems because they can address their own problems. Thank you. Now, the guarantee which is in the recommendation, you cannot guarantee a job if you cannot guarantee business. I think we have to agree on that. And who can guarantee on business? Uh, and studies available show that really the lifespan of companies has been reduced from 90 years in 1935 to around only 18 years today. So how can you guarantee really uh, jobs where you cannot be able to guarantee uh, businesses? Uh, and who is going now even in terms of financing? It's not mentioned in the report. Whose responsibility to implement this? It's not mentioned in the report. That's presumably, it's the government which has to do that. Now, I don't know that governments are able to guarantee uh, such. Uh, and of course, we social partners can be able to do this through uh, collective bargaining agreements which we enter into between workers and employers. And the more you enter collective bargaining agreements, you provide for better uh, terms and conditions of employment. I think that's what I... Uh, I wanted to make that, that we are not able to guarantee employment in a position where our business ourselves are not guaranteed in such a stiff competition. And all these problems, the VUCA, uh, the, the, the vulnerable and predictable environment, with the Trump's uh, trade and all these uh, con conditions, you cannot both guarantee businesses and you cannot guarantee jobs where, and then you, you, you guarantee jobs. That, that, that's what we want to put. Thank you. For giving me the floor. And in fact, in the report, it doesn't mention to the blue economy. And while we, say, we know that actually there's a lot of debate, a lot of conversation going around the blue economy, very important for the small island states and from, for the coastal countries. So it's very important for us to consider because there we can create a lot of jobs for our youth, for our local entrepreneurs. And uh, this is very important. And Seychelles is actually championing the blue economy concept. So it's important for us to take into consideration where we can create more jobs for our youth. Uh, I wanted to make a comment uh, regarding youth and employment. Uh, it is correct that we don't know if they want to move into formal employment. But uh, in Seychelles, we're trying to push the youth to go into formal employment. The reason behind it is if they don't go into formal employment, they don't pay any pension, so they won't benefit from the, from the pension when they stop working. This is one of the reasons why we're trying to push for them to go into formal employment. Okay. Um, look, thank you for uh, for the panel members' input and also um, uh, the contributions from the audience. But I think particularly, uh, I think this is the first poll that the ILO has taken on the uh, ten recommendations, and it's, so it's um, very interesting to see the outcome. But I must say, I'm not particularly surprised by it. I think an important thing to to note on this that the Future of Work report is not a report 
by the ILO, it's a report to the ILO. And this is where it comes into our, our decision making processes and as I indicated before, into the uh, conference in particular for the potential uh, declaration at the end of this. There, there were just a couple of issues I thought I'd, I'd um, briefly refer to. The first one up there around the lifelong learning. I think um, it's extremely uh, pleasing to see the strong support for that and for that whole recommendation um, uh, and the impact that it can have. I think if we look at the whole of the multilateral system, you can't identify any single multilateral UN organisation that is responsible for this. There is nobody who has the responsibility for lifelong learning, for skills and all of these sorts of things. And I think this is one of these areas where I spoke about earlier about a reorientation of the priority and role of the ILO. This needs to be one of those areas that we certainly should be focusing on to fill that huge gap that is out there. Um, the Minister referred to, uh, and a number of others referred to, the uh, issue around um, youth and, and the, just the enormous uh, challenge we have around youth employment, the need for much better quality research. I think I would have to concede, and I'm sure that um, many other organisations concede, that despite the effort, despite the money, despite the work that has been done to try and tackle this whole issue of youth employment, we just simply have not achieved it yet. We still have to do a, uh, I, I think it needs a major rethink as to the approach that we take on addressing this problem that is a problem right around the world. And as the Minister referred to, it's not just a case of, of these young people not having work, but it's the case of the loss of dignity and the loss of place in society that comes with not having a job. And this, for the future, is probably one of the most uh, critical issues facing us.